All right, so I want to start with the Milky Way formation model. And really, um, any model has to fit the available evidence. So when we consider what we have learned about spiral galaxies and barred spiral galaxies so far, what are some questions that you could ask um, about how it formed based on the evidence that we see here? So I'll give you a chance to type this into the chat about a minute. All right, all kinds of good questions. So yeah, you thought of a lot of the things I thought of as well. Um, why is there so much gas and dust in the disk as opposed to anywhere else outside the galaxy, such as in its halo? Um, why is it rotating? Has it always been spinning this fast? Um, does the rotation speed increase as it ages? Why is there a central bulge? Um, what's the mass distribution between planets and stars or gas and dust, maybe even dark matter? Um, and do these galaxies still look at this when we look at images of spirals like this Andromeda galaxy? Um, is there any chance that this galaxy could have changed shape in the since we have received its light? All right. So lots of different questions that you can ask about uh, spiral galaxies based on the evidence we see in the image. Um, those are basically the same exact things I came up with, how much of the mass is distributed in different objects. Um, why is the bulge a different color? It looks to me like the bulge is more yellowish and then the spiral arms, especially near the edge, look a lot bluer. Um, why is most of the visible matter in the disk? And that number is about 80%, it turns out, for Milky Way at least. Um, and then also you could ask about the ages of different objects. So we can get at all of this information using what we learned from light, right? So um, that's been done. You've read about all the evidence. And so what I wanna do now is just look at the evidence specifically and see what we can infer based on everything we know about our galaxy. Um, in that activity, hopefully that just reinforced what you saw in the reading. Um, we're looking at the difference in, you know, the properties of stars in different parts of the galactic structure. So comparing the disk and the halo in particular, um, the most obvious thing that we notice is that the orbits of stars in the disk are within the galactic plane. So that's what we call coplanar. Um, so they have coplanar circular orbits. Whereas the halo stars have elliptical orbits, they're much less circular. So those are squashed um, and they can be tilted any which direction out of plane. So very different um, orbital uh, properties of these stars. The second thing that we notice is that looking at stars colors, we see a lot more blue stars within the disk. And that indicates that those uh, are young stars, but we also see redder stars within the disk. So the disk has both some old and young stars. The halo on the other hand has mostly old stars. And part of the reason for this is it just doesn't have a lot of dust and gas. So there's not a lot of new star formation in the halo. Whereas in the disk, we see very clearly lots of dust. There's also lots of gas. And so there's active star formation. And we talked about the evidence for that um, star formation when we talked about how spiral arms form. All right, the third thing that we can notice about the disk stars versus the halo stars is that in the disk, those stars are more rich in heavy elements, whereas the halo stars are relatively poor in heavy elements. And the, the way I like to think about this is that earlier generations of stars started out mostly being made from hydrogen and helium. And in their cores, their nuclear furnaces fuse those elements into heavier elements. So then when they explode and enrich the interstellar medium with those heavy elements, the next generation of stars starts out with more heavy elements in their raw materials. So that's consistent with the idea that the uh, newer stars that are forming in the disk are not the original generation of stars in this galaxy. They're a younger crop. All right, any questions about some of the differences here? All right. So um, we can try to organize our thoughts about the evidence that we see in the galaxy in all kinds of different ways, but I kind of like doing it in a table. So you can think of the different parts of the galaxy. Uh, we've talked about the disk and halo. Now I'm going to add the bulge too. And then we'll consider all of these different properties. So when we think about the shape of these items, right, these parts of the structure, they're very different. The disk is obviously disk shaped. Um, the bulge is kind of football shaped. It's elongated because we're a barred spiral galaxy. And then the halo is spherical. 
Uh, we notice a difference in brightness very clearly as well. The disc is very bright, the bulge is very bright, but the halo is very dim. When we look at pictures of far away spiral galaxies, we don't even see their halos, right? We only see their discs and their bulges. And that's because the halo doesn't contain very much visible matter. Those globular clusters are also containing uh, mostly dim older stars. So as a result, the halo being very sparse and with dimmer stars on average is a pretty dim object. Um, the star orbits we just talked about. Um, when we add our bulge into this discussion, uh, I would note that it has some of each type of stellar orbit. So you can think of the bulge as having kind of intermediate properties between the disk and halo um, for the most part. Um, star color, so that indicates star age is also quite different. So we talked about white and blue stars in the disk being the youngest, red stars in the halo being the oldest, and the bulge has some of each. So it's got um, intermediate mixes of stellar ages. There is some active star formation in the bulge, but not as much as in the rest of the disk. Um, so that's just what I'm saying here. No stellar formation in the halo, lots in the disk, and some in the bulge, but not as much. And then when we talked about heavy elements, the disk contains the highest fraction of heavy elements. Uh, the halo is the lowest and the bulge again is intermediate between the two. So in the activity, um, hopefully you were able to deduce that, you know, the halo is made of old stars that are not rich in heavy elements. Those might be some of the first generation of stars in our galaxy. So the halo probably formed first. The bulge age is probably intermediate between the disk and the halo. And then the disk is our youngest feature. So how does our model explain that ranking of ages between those structures? This is the formation model that we're looking at. So we've got some um, large giant cloud of ga gas and dust that our galaxy starts out with. And um, if you watch the YouTube video that was recommended before class, um, it talks about how everything is in motion in sort of random directions Nevertheless, you could calculate an overall average rotation of the whole system. So that slow average rotation is oriented around some axis. Um, and that's just due to all the random motions of everything within that gas cloud added together. And as this gas cloud starts to collapse under its own gravity, maybe triggered by, who knows, um, dark matter or uh, triggered by the galactic, uh, you know, interaction from some other uh, galaxy. We'll see when we talk about the early universe, what might have been going on at this stage. But for now, let's just say we have a, a gas cloud that starts to collapse under its own gravity. And as it starts to do so, some areas of the cloud collapse uh, faster than others because they're a little more dense than other regions. Those become the globular clusters that we see in the halo. Meanwhile, the rest of the system is still collapsing. And as it collapses, it is rotationally flattening and it's also spinning faster and faster. So this is like the um, ice skater when they pull in their arms as mass becomes closer to this central axis, then their spin speed goes faster and faster. That's what's happening in our galaxy as well. And that um, fast spin speed causes material to be flattened out into that disk shape. This process continues until eventually most of the matter is contained within the disk. And now the youngest crop of stars starts to form within that disk. So this model explains lots of the features that we see. Um, here's this rotational flattening idea in case you've never seen it before. If you have a round system and you spin it, there's a higher centrifugal force at the equatorial region than there is at the polar region. So that higher force presses the uh, object out into a flatter shape. So this is what I mean when I say rotational flattening. The rotation itself is what is responsible for the system flattening out into a disk shape. All right, so how does this model explain our observations? Well, the globular clusters are distributed in a sphere. They're the oldest stars in our galaxy. So that supports the idea that they formed first in this system. And it supports the idea that this initial um, gas cloud had the shape of a sphere, not a disk. 
another um, factor we can point out is that um, the slower rotation of the system when it was a large system, like in number two, um, causes the halo stars to be in large orbits, first of all. And because they haven't um, been flattened into the disk yet, then they have elliptical and random orbits. So they are part of the you know, randomly moving clumps of matter in the original cloud. And so those clumps of matter still have those orbits and those random orbits are inherited by the globular clusters that the matter became. All right, and then finally, it explains why most of the matter is in the disk because of the rotational flattening, first of all. And it explains why the disk stars have circular orbits because they were born in the disk, which was already orbiting uh, where you know the gas was already orbiting the center of the galaxy in a circular motion. And so the disk stars inherit the rotational properties of the gas that they were born from in the disk. So that's the model. This is not necessarily the whole story, but it does do a good job of explaining our observations. Um, if you've taken 122, you'll notice that this looks an awful lot like the formation process for um, a star and the planets around it, right? So this is echoed in the solar system formation. So I wanna talk about one complication to this tidy model, which is the idea of tidal interactions. So um, we've discussed tidal forces before. Tidal forces are just um, the uh, difference in gravity across two sides of a single object that can cause that object to be deformed or torn apart. And there is some evidence, um, well, actually abundant evidence, that this happens to small dwarf galaxies orbiting large uh, spiral galaxies. And what happens when a um, dwarf galaxy is tidally pulled apart is that the stars within it become what we call a tidal stream. So some of those stars will end up, um, you know, stretching into an orbit that surrounds the galaxy. And this can happen uh, multiple times with multiple dwarf galaxies and leave behind several tidal streamers, which are persistent over billions of years. Um, this process is currently happening to at least two dwarf galaxies in, uh, that orbit the Milky Way. And I say at least because um, it's hard to see some of these dwarf galaxies. They're on the other, at least the Sagittarius is on the other side of the disk from us. And so it's possible that there are other dwarf galaxies we have not yet observed. We have at least observed Sagittarius and we can make out the traces of the tidal streams from both of those dwarfs. Um, at the end of this process, once many of the, I guess you could say, uh, the kind of less dense stellar regions in the exterior of a galaxy are stripped away, then the more dense core where stars are um, more densely clustered, so they're more likely to hang together due to gravity, right? There's more mass in less space. So those dense cores can survive this process and they may, they may uh, account for some of the very large globular clusters that we have in our halo. So some of those globular clusters might not be from those first generations. They might actually be the nuclei of um, tidally rent apart dwarf galaxies. All right, if the disk rotates, will be eventually be on the side of the dwarf galaxies? Yeah, eventually, but it does take, um, I can't remember what the orbital period of the sun is now. I suppose we could calculate it if we feel like it, um, but it will take millions of years. So for the, for the perspective of astronomy, not very soon. <laughs>